So today we're going to be continuing with our organic chemistry unit and we're going to be covering aromic hydrocarbons. So in the last video we were introduced to aliphatic hydrocarbons, but now we're going to introduce the second classification, which is aromatic hydrocarbons. Aromatic hydrocarbons are ring structures that are unsaturated and because of their unique structures, they're considered to be very stable. The simplest aromatic hydrocarbon and the hydrocarbon that we're going to be concerned with in this course is known as benzene. Benzene has a chemical formula of C6H6, so there's an equal ratio of carbons to hydrogens in the structure, unlike in a non-aromatic ring. Typically, benzene is depicted as having three double bonds and three single bonds, but this is not the case. In reality, benzene's bonds are actually identical in length, and this is due to the fact that benzene and all aromatic hydrocarbons undergo resonance. We will learn more about resonance in the next unit, but for now, it is enough to know that it's the reason why aromatic hydrocarbons are so stable. Since there is resonance, it's, it also means that there are delocalized electrons shared between all six carbons. Now there's two ways that benzene is commonly depicted in textbooks and on tests. Uh, in the first one, benzene is depicted as having three double bonds. It's just the line structure for it. And in the second one, there's a circle in the middle of the hexagon ring. And this basically represents that there's resonance in the structure and that those six delocalized electrons that I talked about earlier are shared equally amongst all six carbons. So when we want to name compounds that have benzene rings in them, there are two different ways that this can be done. If the benzene ring is the parent chain, where there could be some other functional groups or small alkyl groups attached to the ring, then we're going to use the word benzene as the root of the name. If there are any other groups attached to the benzene, then they're named just like we've named substituent groups before. In terms of numbering, Similar to hydrocarbons, if there's only one substituent group attached to benzene, then we can just say it's bonded to carbon one. If there happens to be more than one substituent group attached to benzene, then we are going to assign carbon one to the substituent that is first alphabetically. And then we're gonna want a number in the direction that is closer to the next substituent group. Now, if benzene happens to be part of a longer hydrocarbon chain, or one that might contain a double or triple bond, then benzene is going to act as a substituent group itself. The name for benzene as one of these groups is phenol, where it has one less hydrogen than normal benzene would. And we'd include phenol with any other substituent group and the naming process would go just like what we've already discussed before for other hydrocarbons. So when we're naming benzene rings, we could use these naming conventions that describe where two substituent groups are on the ring relative to each other. The first one is the ortho prefix. It's used to describe two groups that are right beside each other at the carbon one and the carbon two position. Next is the meta prefix. It's used to describe two groups that are one carbon apart at the carbon one and carbon three position. And finally, we have the para prefix, which is used to describe two, car two substituent groups sorry, that are two carbons apart at carbon one and carbon four. If we're naming compounds using these prefixes, then you're going to want to include the proper one at the very beginning of the name and separate it from the rest of the word with a hyphen. So I have two naming examples for us, and we're going to start with the example on the left. So here, we're first going to need to identify our parent chain. As you can see here, we have one benzene ring that is bonded to two other atoms. We have one halogen and one alkyl group. So this benzene is actually going to act as our parent chain. Uh, next, we're going to want to identify our substituent groups. We see here that we have one bromine group and then one ethyl group. And we're also going to want to number our carbon chain in the correct fashion. So carbon one is going to be assigned to the substituent group that's first alphabetically. That happens to be bromine. So this is going to be carbon one. And if we're going to want to number it in the direction that's closest to the next substituent, we're going to want to start numbering it uh, clockwise. 
So this would be carbon 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And just like that, we've numbered our entire carbon chain. And we're ready to start assembling it. So we're going to include our substituents first. We have bromine at the first position. We also have ethyl at the second position. And then the root of our word is just going to be benzene because the parent chain is a benzene. So just like that, we have the name as 1-bromo-2-ethyl-benzene. Now we could write this another way using one of the naming conventions I previously stated. So it could also be written as ortho because these two substituent groups are right beside each other. It would be ortho bromo ethyl benzene. And that's how you would name the first one. For the one on the right, we see here that we also have a benzene ring, but there's also a very long carbon chain. And if you count the number of corners that it has, you'll get a total of seven. And since this carbon chain also has another substituent group, in this situation, we are going to consider the benzene to just be one of the substituent groups. So, now we're also going to need the, to number the carbon chain that is seven carbons long in the correct direction. We're going to want to give the substituent group that is first alphabetically the lower carbon number. Chlorine comes before phenol. This isn't considered a benzene. It's now considered a phenol group in this situation. So this is going to be carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So we see here that benzene is attached to carbon seven and chlorine is attached to carbon one. So just like that, we're ready to start assembling our name. So we'll put one chloral, seven phenol, and then just heptane, which is the prefix for a seven carbon chain, and include the fact that it is an alkane chain. And that's how you would name the second one. All right, so now I have two drawing examples for us to do, and we're gonna start with para-dichlorobenzene. So let's break down this name a little bit more. We see here that we have benzene as the root of the word, so we know that that is going to be our parent structure. So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw in a benzene ring here, and I will use the circle in the middle this time to indicate that it is in fact a benzene ring. Next, we're going to want to add in our substituent groups. We see here that there is a dichloro in front of the benzene, indicating to us that there is going to be two chlorines attached to this benzene ring. And we also see the word para. Now remember, para means that there is going to be a substituent group present at the one carbon position and the four carbon position. And so we know that that's where our chlorines are going to be present. So at the one carbon position, I'm going to draw the first chlorine here. That's going to be my first carbon. And then at the fourth carbon position, which is right there, I'm just going to draw in my second chlorine. And just like that, we have the structure for para-dichlorobenzene. So next we're going to want to draw the structure for 1-bromo-3-phenyl-hept-5-ine. So here we see that benzene is no longer the parent structure. It's actually one of the substituent groups, which is why it's now being called phenol. So first, let's draw in our parent chain. We see here we have a hept, so we know that it's going to be seven carbons long. And we also see here that we have a YNE ending, so we know that there is going to be just one triple bond present in the structure at the fifth position because it's included right there. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw the base for that. And so I just went ahead and drew the structure for us. I'll also just number it right now so we know where each carbon is. And now we're going to draw in the substituent groups as well. Let's start with 1-bromo. We know that there's going to be one bromine group present at the first carbon position. 
So right at carbon 1 right here, we just draw in our bromine. And then at the third carbon, we also know that there is going to be a phenyl group present. And so I'm just going to draw in my carbon chain, oh, not my carbon chain, my benzene ring right here. Draw another circle to indicate that it's a benzene ring. And just like that, we have the complete structure for 1-bromo-3-phenyl-hept-5-ene ion. I also just want to introduce some structures that are common enough to have their own special name, as well as introduce some functional groups that we're going to work with later. So at first we have a phenyl. This phenyl is bonded to this OH group up here, and this group is also referred to as an alcohol group. Next we have a toluene. As you can see, the toluene is just simply bonded to one methyl group. Next we have an aniline. In here it is bonded to this NH2 group, which is also referred to as an amine group. And finally we have xylene. Xylene is similar to toluene except it has two methyl groups bonded to the benzene. Now here we have xylene present in the meta position, but it is also possible that we could have two methyl groups bonded at the ortho position or at the para position, but it is going to be most stable in this methyl position that I'm showing right now. So now we're going to look at some of the properties of aromatic hydrocarbons. When they don't have any functional groups or anything of the nature bonded to them, they are only made up of carbons and hydrogen, so they are considered to be nonpolar. Additionally, that means that they are immiscible in water. Typically at room temperature, you're going to find them in a liquid or kind of a crystalline solid state, depending on what type of hydrocarbon you have. If we want to look specifically at benzene, then benzene does have a distinct smell. It smells pretty sweet and kind of gasoline-like, but you don't want to let that fool you because benzene is a very toxic a substance and it is also considered to be a carcinogen. Now we also are dealing with hydrocarbons here so they are flammable. Now if we want to look at the reactivity of aromatic hydrocarbons they are considered to be more reactive than alkanes and less reactive than alkenes. They also tend not to go undergo addition reactions since they are so naturally stable. Adding an atom would mean one of their bonds would have to break, which would make the molecule less stable, which isn't preferred. Instead, they tend to undergo substitution reactions where we're going to replace one of the hydrogens with another molecule while maintaining kind of the internal structure of that aromatic hydrocarbon. So first, we're going to go through a reaction between benzene which we have here, and then chlorine gas. So if these were to react together, I'm just going to draw this hydrogen here in a substitution reaction. We would see that the final products would be one benzene ring now with a chlorine attached to it. And then we would also see the formation of hydrochloric acid. Now I'm just going to do another example of a substitution reaction that could occur. We could have another benzene ring here and react it with nitric acid, which is HNO3. If we do that, we see here that we have our hydrogen. It would result in a benzene ring with one NO2 group and then it would also produce water. So those are just two examples of possible substitution reactions that could occur with aromatic hydrocarbons. There are some more that could happen, but with that, we're just gonna conclude today's lesson.